Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Good morning and welcome to your Partner in Success Radio, where top performers share their secrets to help you achieve your personal and your professional goals. I am your host, Denise Griffiths, and together with my amazing guest, we bring you inspiring and actionable insights to help you take your life and your business to the next level. Now, ranked in the top 2% globally, this podcast really is a must listen, and it's because of my guests. So whether you're tuning in for entrepreneurial tips, career advice, or personal development strategies, get ready to turn inspiration into action, challenges into triumphs, and dreams into reality. And get ready to tune in and take notes, as today I get to introduce two dynamic leaders from the 100 Coaches Agency, Scott Osman, the founder and CEO, brings a wealth of experience in amplifying leadership impact and fostering high-performing teams. And meanwhile, Jacqueline Lane, the agency's president, is committed to elevating leadership standards globally with a focus on conscious capitalism, and I'll get her to explain that to me, and entrepreneurship. So they join me today to share their insights on leadership development, sustainability, and the power of purpose-driven businesses. So join us for actionable strategies, inspiring stories that will leave you motivated and help you make a podca- a positive impact in your own leadership journey. Welcome to your Partner in Success Radio, Scott and Jacqueline. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Great to be here with you, Denise. Listen, I've got questions. <laughs> so I have all... Uh, your questions we have stories oh good 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 that's what i want so can you share a bit about yourselves i'll start with you scott and the wonderful ways that you navigate with the world sure well gosh um you know i'll i'll tell you so i um i've I've had a i've had a well navigate with the world so um i navigate with the world um by seeing people deeply uh, it's kind of sort of been a, a through line for my whole life. I was actually a fortune, fashion and portrait photographer first. Uh, and then I was a branding professional for many, many years. Um, and both of those professions are really about how to see people um, without any filter, without any, uh, you know, just see see who they are. And then I met Marshall Goldsmith, uh, Marshall's number one executive coach in the world, uh, maybe 10 years ago. And um, he and I, uh, he he came up with this idea that he wanted to teach 15 people, everything he knew about coaching. Um, I'm sure at some point we'll get into the story of how that all happened um, and and what it is. But now um, I run together with Jacqueline, um, the world's premier executive coaching agency, working with the best executive coaches in the world uh, and pairing with them with leaders and heads of government who have real influence and impact on the lives of, I don't know, tens, hundreds of millions of people. Um, our whole business really is whole business. I guess, really, I, I guess on a certain level, my whole life, uh, is really about seeing people and connecting them with others. And I love that because listen, I, anybody who knows me or listens to me understands that I am a highly committed introvert. It doesn't mean I don't like people, but I can only be around them largely for, oh, 59 and three quarter minutes. I've timed it, <laughs> but, but through this podcast, I get to meet people like you and people, fascinating people from all over the world. And leadership, honestly, is one of our biggest topics. And there's a reason for that. Yeah, I, I agree. There was a time where I thought, as, as a branding professional, I thought by by positioning companies, you could change the world. Uh, and I soon realized that it's it's really only through leadership can we make a difference. That, that leaders really influence so many people uh, in good or bad ways. Uh, and to the extent that we can help leaders be the best leaders they can be, um, we can do great things. Well, I agree with you. So Jacqueline, uh, tell us about you. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, very similarly to Scott, 
I really see the world in terms of relationships and community. These have kind of become the core themes of my life. Uh, and there was a time in my life where I was very much focused on what do I need to do to get ahead and um, saw my success as in competition to other people. And it was a kind of a zero sum game, um, but had had a bit of a, a transformative, um, what we might call an unlock moment where I really saw in a dream and realized just how important uh, things are in relationship and how none of us really do this alone. We need each other. We belong to each other. And so um, the focus of my life really shifted from that time onward. And I just love knowing people, um, really understanding who they are. And if I close my eyes and kind of picture the world, I see it as one giant mesh network. Uh, I see where connections exist, where connections should exist, where they could be stronger. Uh, and so it's just this idea of uh, just loving people and being around them, um, promoting our friends, sharing them for sharing friends with other friends uh, has really become a, a core theme. And uh, we get, we're very fortunate to get to do that a lot at the hundred coaches agency. Hmm. And see, so you just connect, you just actually dissected the reason why I do my podcast. I am an introvert, but I love to meet people and share and help and, this podcast is just amazing for that. So I guess we're done here. You you just explained my yeah. podcast. Thanks, Denise. It's been great spending yeah, this time. Yeah, hasn't it? <laughs> so, but thank you for that. And it makes sense. And you said, Jacqueline, that um, it, it's like a dream. Are you a lucid dreamer? I have to ask because I am. For sure. I figured you might be. Good for you because that's how we find things out that don't pop up during the day. Certainly. I think of many core realizations that have happened in my life have been in that lucid dreaming state. Uh, and there's, you know, it's funny, like a lot of dreams I don't remember, but the, there are these probably 10 to 15 very core dreams that I remember very vividly and have shaped a lot of the direction of my life. I love that. And I write them down if I can, mm. you know, my lucid dreams, I remember them just before I'm actually going to wake up. And right before a cat jumps on my bladder, I can feel him. Mm. <laughs> and I'm grabbing a notepad next to me going, dit, 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 and I'm scribbling. It because they're brilliant. I mean, they're coming from somewhere. So pay attention. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, listen, for both of you, how does executive coaching serve as a catalyst for enhancing leadership skills and fostering growth? I mean, I think you've touched on it a bit. But are, are there any particular action items that you would like to share? Um, sh yes, there are. <laughs> so, um, Keep going. Well, I'll give you so a little background. I, um, I didn't know anything about executive coaching 10, eight years ago. Um, I had met Marshall, but I really wasn't in that world. And, uh, and then Marshall said, called me up one day, said, hey, I want to teach 15 people everything I know about coaching. Um, would you help? And I said, sure. And, and since then, um, we, uh, we initiated the hundred coaches community, which is now over 400 leaders, leadership thinkers, and leadership coaches. Four years ago, we created the hundred coaches agency, Jacqueline and I together created our curation process. Um, and we are connecting some of the greatest coaches in the world with some of the greatest leaders and heads of government. Uh, it's really, it's extraordinary actually that in, in eight years uh, since since Marshall and I had that first thing, and then four years since Jacqueline and I did this, uh, that we're now in this um, unbelievably privileged position of helping influence great leaders uh, to become even better leaders. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed is everybody has blind spots, right? There's nobody out there. There's no leader out there that can't become a better leader. Uh, there's nobody out there that uh, is fully realized as human being um, and can use the support of somebody else. Um, and executive coaching is such an amazing way to do that. Um, and, um, and, and we've now, I guess we've combined what, maybe over 400 people uh, at these very senior levels and 100% of the time uh, they have a successful engagement in advancing their goals and ambitions. Hmm. Um, and it's really because the uh, the executive coach is that trusted partner that can be open and honest um, in a very neutral way. 
and help people understand the things that they're missing and how to overcome them. Uh, they can hear the things that they can't hear from other people. Um, about, um, gosh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, we had this idea that um, we knew we knew that uh, in the world of executive coaching, the most important factor to, to a successful outcome is the quality of the person being coached. And it wasn't so much that it would be a good person, bad person, uh, but there were certain attributes that made them coachable. And uh, we looked around for a book to recommend to people and found that there was no book. Um, and so, oh gosh, it it's in about five or six months, uh, we wrote the book, Becoming Coachable with Marshall. Uh, and then in September, it came out. In October, it was a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Um, but more importantly, I think we've, we've figured out how to unlock uh, the potential in anybody to become coachable through... Um, I guess what we call our openness framework. Yeah. You know, I often think that I'm not coachable because my GPS is not the boss of me. I fight with <laughs> everything, but it turns out that I am coachable, but I had to get out of my own way. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we all do. Well, let's, let's test out our theory, uh -oh. uh, Denise, and let's see if you're coachable. Test Jacqueline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um go ahead so in the in the book the, the book becoming coachable this is i mean i have to say now that we're like i'm a little distance from it um and uh i enjoy reading it which is great uh now that I, now they don't attach to it so much and we had a, we had a, a, so much fun writing it and i think it comes out in the book um but the core of the book the second part two of the book uh the first part of the book talks about the mechanics of coaching and what to look for in a coach and all that kind of, but the middle of the book uh, is about what it takes to become coachable. And uh, what we articulate is what we call the openness framework, because uh, the first you know thing to think about with becoming coachable is you have to be open. And the first thing you have to be open to is being open to change. Um, if you're unwilling to change, then that is like one of the first key indicators that you're not coachable. Um, and it's a funny thing. It's a little insidious. I always thought that I was open to change. Uh, and I was looking for a coach and I kept meeting, you know, and we have these great coaches in our network. We kept meeting coaches and they'd say, what do you want to work on? I'd say, you know, life is pretty good. And I don't, I can't see anything in particular that I, that I want to work on and change. I'm, I'm, I'm open to change, uh, but I couldn't pick anything out. And then, um, and then I met a, a gentleman by the name of Gene, uh, who uh, it's about a year and a half ago. He's still my coach today. And, um, and Gene said, okay. Well, uh, if you don't have anything to work on, why don't we work on expansion? Because mm. the thought that you don't have anything that you want to work on is in and of, in and of itself a self-limiting belief. It doesn't. I just wrote like that it. down. I was writing down limiting belief right as you said it. Yeah, yeah, and it's so. It was so interesting. The minute he said it, it was such a total unlock for me, and I realized that. Um, being open to change doesn't mean finding something that's negative that you want to change. Um, but it just means um, being open to sometimes accepting. More. Yeah. Sometimes more, sometimes just accepting sort of the evolution of where things are going and looking beyond the horizon or whatever it is, not being satisfied in the moment. Um, although, you know, satisfied, not satisfied. Um, so for me, the biggest, the first big unlock was being open to change. And that became the first of the four principles in the openness framework. So Denise, if you're open to change, you're 25% of the way there. <laughs> well, I'm always open to change. I really, yeah. am. now does it scare me sometimes? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And other times it just irritates me. <laughs> well, if, you, if you get irritated by change uh, i get irritated by my one? i get irritated by my attitude about change it's like i'm too busy yeah. Yeah, and there's always <laughs> a big list of excuses and then that irritates me i'm cranky, I'm a cranky yeah. i know i feel you there I think, uh, Denise, you and I might <laughs> might struggle with the same thing, which is for me, it was the second piece in our openness framework, which is being open to feedback. Like you, I'm like, I think I know better than my GPS. I don't know. <laughs> says turn left here. No, you know, so I don't many. think so. So I, I go get lost. <laughs> right. Uh, so 
for me that openness to feedback was was a big one because you know feedback is a very funny thing i think especially for when in, we get a lot of unsolicited feedback sometimes, and maybe not all feedback is helpful, um, but it is always illuminating. It tells us something about the way that other people perceive us uh, and the way that other people experience us in the world. And the reality is that a lot of people, as they become bigger and bigger leaders with more and more authority, um, access to feedback really dries up. People are intimidated or afraid to share okay. feedback because of real or perceived power dynamics at play. Um, and so, but feedback is really essential because we can't become aware of our blind spots without the benefit of an external perspective. And it really struck me that I can't actually call myself a self-aware person without understanding the perceptions and viewpoints of other people, because there are simply things that we can't see about ourselves. Uh, and so, but, yeah, like most things, <laughs> things, yeah. Um, but it's it's an amazing thing how we have been trained to hear the word feedback as criticism, right? When someone says, "Can I give you some feedback?" Typically, most people, myself certainly included, tense up and go, "Oh no, I'm going to prepare myself for the worst." Um, so it's really rethinking my own relationship with feedback and seeing it as a gift um, that has really transformed my life. Um, and helped me to grow in new ways that I never would have imagined before. Yeah, I think also uh, Marshall has a beautiful, it's, it's a, I find it a bit of a clunky word, but it's it's so perfectly expressive. Mm -hmm. He calls it feed forward. Um, mm -hmm. and, and he calls it feed forward because um, what he says is, you know, we can't change the past. So don't tell me what I should have done. Um, but we can make adjustments to the future. So tell me what I should do. Uh, going forward, give me feed forward. Um, and that also, I think, lessens the sting a little bit. Because sure, when someone says, like, you did that poorly, or you should have done it differently, I think part of the resistance is, like, I can't change that now. Uh, whereas if someone says, gee, you know, um, the next time you do that, um, why don't you think about doing it this way? Um, now you have, you know, the opportunity to make a choice and to do it differently. And you know, sometimes the feedback that you're getting is in your own head. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest with you, if anybody spoke to me the way I often, or catch myself rather, I'm getting better about it, catch myself talking to myself, I'd need bail money. <laughs> I'm not joking, I'd be in jail. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's a that negative self-talk. It's a real pervasive problem um but we can we can work on that too mm -hmm. well and a coach is good for that yeah, right. yeah. so if you're op open to change open to feedback um sounds like you're open to feedback with an asterisk maybe um, um just don't tell me to go left i ain't doing it <laughs> turn left now no <laughs> no no that Let's is not going. the right way no. Uh, but you can hear it. You can hear the feedback. Then, you know, those two, that's your, you're kind of halfway there. Um, and that's that's huge, right? Because now um, you can see that there are things in yourself that you would, would like to be different. Uh, you can hear from others. You know, I think also one thing that uh, that's interesting about feedback is it doesn't have to be right or wrong. Um, it really could just be another perspective so that you see things a little bit more dimensionally. Yeah. We quit labeling it. Mm -hmm. That can be very helpful. So I um, coached very early on in my career, which is about 20 years ago now. And I had never worked with a coach. She wasn't an executive coach, but she was great. And I must have been whining a lot about the mm -hmm. same thing over and over again. And she was very quiet. She said, Denise, I went, yes, ma'am, because I knew something was going to hit me right in the forehead. She said, what are you tolerating? And it was so simple and it was so profound that it just had me speechless. I'm not mm. often speechless. But the next day I was driving 10 hours from where I live in Southwest Louisiana to Atlanta, Georgia with my best friend. We were going there. I can't remember why we were going now. And I was telling her about this and we embarked on a huge conversation about what we were tolerating and why it was life altering for both of us. But we didn't wow. know to ask it. Mm. 
Amazing. And yeah. And then once you become aware of those things, uh, the third step in our framework, and it sounds like this is the same uh, realization you all had, which is that you have to take action on those things that you hear. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Or right. being open to change and being open to feedback. That's good. But if you're not willing to take action, you're not coachable because the whole work of coaching and becoming coachable is about creating the change, not just seeing it and hearing it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> right, right, right. And, you know, I am a huge fan of Dr. Napoleon Hill. In fact, my Wednesday um, co-host on my podcast is Dr. Ben Gay, not Dr. Dr. Napoleon Hill was the final protege, final mentor. Ben Gay was, I'm getting this confused. Ben Gay was a final mentee for Dr. Napoleon Hill before he passed away. Wow. He will say, Often, you know, people treat the, you know, science of getting rich, th think and grow rich, like that's a big mystery. He said, Dr. Napoleon Hill said multiple times in that book, take action. Mm -hmm. That's the piece that so many people just go, oh, okay, I'll do that later. No, 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 no. Do it now. Yep. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. That's the difference, right? Yeah. Is lots of people talk about things. Um but the, the core differentiator is the people who actually do things. Mm -hmm. So Okay, true. we'll keep going. So you gave and me- And then the fourth. There you go. The final step in our openness right. framework is being open to being held accountable. Oof. Because, uh, yeah, accountability <laughs> is a big <laughs> <Sorry>. word. <laughs> yeah, I flinched with you. <laughs> that is a, whoa. Okay, fine, uh, if yeah. I have to. Yeah, it's a loaded word. And it, the reality is uh, lasting change is what we're after here. So mm -hmm. many people can make a change temporarily. Like I can stick to a diet for a day, but can I stick mm -hmm. to it in an ongoing way or stick to a, an exercise plan? Uh, it's hard. You, it is you, hard. I have, for me personally, those habits that take time to cultivate those changes that I really want to be in my life and want to be lasting. Uh, if I don't have some kind of system of accountability, um, I, I lose motivation quickly. You know, we are lots of research has now come out that says motivation is a finite resource. We only have so much of it in a day. And so if we leave things only to our own motivation, uh, we're likely to fail. And so a great coach is someone who can help, uh, help you understand what your goals are, uh, help you make a positive change and then stick with that change over time. I find that accountability is best served when it's through another person. Uh, just, you know, Marshall has this great framework also called daily questions where you write your own questions, but someone else calls you every day and asks you the questions. So you, you pick the questions and you give a score for it, but the, just the process of, an, of being accountable to another human being really makes these habits stick, uh, makes it really top of mind. Um, and, and that to me is just, whew, that's, that's a yeah, tough one. That's gold. Um, Denise, that was, um, Marshall wrote that in his New York Times bestselling book, Triggers, uh, where he describes what it takes to be, to hold yourself accountable uh, and to create the daily questions process. And it is, it is hard, uh, but if you do it, it's, it is truly magic. I understand what you're saying. And, you know, accountability is, it's, you say, oh, okay, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. I have index cards. It's like, here you go. Cross this one off, cross this one uh -huh. off. Once I get about eight index cards, I'm like, Ugh, <laughs> I lost track. I really did. So for me, and I'm just going to, you know, spitball this, but motivation goes out the window because of distractions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've had a daily question partner for four years now, and uh, we, we talk every morning. It only takes about 10 minutes. I have, I think about 20 questions that I have written that she asks me. I give myself a grade on a scale of one to 10. Um, and I think one of the biggest uh, epiphanies I've had in the daily question process is you have a chance every day to accomplish accomplish those goals. So um, to pick an easy one, um, at the early early on in the uh, in the process, I, I I love coffee. I'm sure, I'm sure there aren't many people who do, but I really love coffee. Um, and I was drinking a lot of coffee and especially, um, into the evening, it was hurting my sleep. And so one of my first early questions was, um, did I try my best? It always starts like this. Did I try my best? 
uh, to stop drinking coffee by three. That was it. And uh, it was hard at the beginning. And then I started to get it. And then over time, I realized that I could do it. I wanted to give myself a 10 every day. Um, and so over the course of time, um, I stopped drinking coffee after three. Uh, I stopped drinking coffee after three. I rarely have dessert. Um, a bunch of a bunch of those kinds of things, but also things to do with exercise, things to do with bad habits. Almost anything can be changed uh, if you hold yourself accountable on a regular basis. And I think the key unlock for me also was um, it doesn't have to be changed permanently every single day. Mm. Right. I think there was a time, I guess it was the first year that I wasn't uh, having dessert. So I used to have a, a real sweet tooth. I probably still do. I just don't, just not as aware of it as I used to be. And I would feel like I, I kind of owed myself dessert after every meal. And so uh, I, one of my daily questions was, did I try my best to not have processed dessert? So I kind of like an orange, but not ice cream or cake or cookies um, after the meal. And at first, um, you know, I did it okay, maybe four times a week, five times a week, I was able to do that. Um, and it kind of sounded like I was failing two or three times a week. Um, but it turns out at the end of the year, I had not had processed dessert 300 times. Or actually, another way to put it is 65 times that year, I had failed. There you go. But the other way to look at it is, 300 times that year, I had succeeded. And 300 times of success was extraordinary. Mm, and really- a habit in the making. Mm -hmm, right. And really put me on the on the path. It kind of frustrates me a little bit. You know, at the beginning of the year, you, you hear all these stories, like people make their New Year's resolutions and by you know, three weeks in, they've failed. And I think, you know, you don't know whether you've succeeded or failed until the end of the year. Because you have a whole year to try to keep that resolution every, you know, on each day. It doesn't have to be every day. On each day you wake up and you can you can hold yourself accountable to the resolution. Yeah. But the idea is that any progress is still a great step forward and makes us much better for trying oh, than yeah. to do nothing. And I what I love about the daily questions process is Marshall recommends starting each question with, did I do my best today? So that effort matters, not just the results or the success of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a really important distinction because, yeah, even though you lost your temper and yelled at the kids, you tried your best, right? You know, yeah. and I, I like, you know, but just be honest with yourself about effort. And, uh, you know, I think we hold our standards to this idea uh, of perfection. Uh, and really, perfection is... Um, it's an illusion. It's an illusion. Yeah. Undoable. It doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and it. I uh, I think it, so many of us get caught up with this um, obsession with perfection that we discount trying. You know that's a good point. And both of you and I wrote this down early on, and then I just started a couple of times because both of you have used the word or the term unlock several times. Tell me what you mean by that. I think I know, but tell our audience what you mean by unlock. Hmm. Uh, what I love about this idea of unlock is it's this process of becoming aware of something that once you see it, you can never unsee it. Uh, it's like a new way of being conscious and aware. Um, and, and what I, I think those are some of the most fulfilling moments in the coaching process is when uh, a perspective is forever changed. Uh, but a lot of times it's the it's a slow progress in one direction. Uh, and so I might uh, compare and contrast this idea with unlock with and the idea of accountability. Um, but I do think they also go hand in hand. Hmm. Yeah, I, sense. yeah, I, I love um, the way unlock kind of frees us up to say, you know, we can, uh, a lot of, a lot of the things that hold us back, um, are self-made constraints. Mm. You know, so many times we think, we think that we can't do something or we think that things have to be a certain way. Um, and I certainly have found that 
the minute I stop thinking that things have to be a certain way or that mm. I have to be a certain way, um, that's kind of an unlocked moment where all of a sudden the the limitations of that thought are released. And I guess I'm kind of unlocking myself mm. for the potential of that change. is not a lot of what I'm going to call procrastination that I actually call it something else, but it's rude. Um, um procrastination isn't that because you're not unlocking you're not seeing things differently you're just hanging on to something that probably is not true and that's going to allow you to procrastinate and shove it off yeah it's but, go ahead this is where i do think this idea of unlock and accountability go hand in hand um because some you know and that's funny they sometimes uh come in different orders Sometimes you have to make a little bit of forward motion and kind of inspire uh, inspire something in yourself that creates an unlock moment. And other times we have an unlock moment, you know, if, from be it a lucid dream or a conversation with a friend or a mentor or coach uh, that changes our perspective forever. And then that also kind of leads our action in a different direction. So, uh, you know, it, it changes for everyone, but uh, sometimes one can very much inform the other. Yeah. I have to say one thing uh, with procrastination for myself. So if I notice I'm procrastinating and I am a big procrastinator. Oh, I um, have to agree. I'm like, I, I'm always amazed at when I finally get around to doing it. It's the same thing I would have done had I not procrastinated. It's and like it wasn't nearly as difficult as you made it no, out to be. No. Like, well, that was easy. What the heck was I upset about? Yep. Why did I cause myself all of that additional work and strife and worry, uh, putting it off? It's like uh, our friend Srikumar Rao talks about double arrows. Like there's the injury and then there's like the thinking about the injury. And uh, sometimes procrastination, it's like, you got to do the thing. That's the first arrow. Okay, I got to do this thing. It's unpleasant. But the second arrow is putting it off and having to relive the I've got to do the thing until you get it done. Exactly. Uh -huh. And I'm learning. I'm teaching myself to reframe. I've got to. I've got to. I've got to. To Oh, I get to. Yes. Mm. Big difference. It's a mental shift and it works most of the time. Not a hundred percent. Sometimes I go, ah, heck with it. And I just go outside and stand <laughs> out in the yard and look at the trees. <laughs> but you know, it's just, if you can change your mindset of it's, oh, I don't want to do this. Oh, I've got to do this. Your immediate when just now, when I said that I gripped my stomach, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. when I say I get to go do this, you know, right after this podcast, I get to go, you know, write a review about their book. I get to, and I'm all excited again. Yeah. That's so great. I love that. Thank you. Well, listen, keep going. I keep interrupting you and I hate that I'm doing that, but let's, but I have questions. I warned yes. you. No, we love your questions. <laughs> so, Tell, ask, ask us more. I will. I will. The openness framework, you, you brought that up a little bit and I would like for you to share with the audience, what does it do and how does it contribute to being coachable? I think you touched on it a bit. Mm -hmm. but, you know, if we did, we can move on, but is there anything else you want to share about that? Yeah, so we'll just sort of double down and, and go through. So the openness framework, as we as we talk about, it's being open to change, open to feedback, open to taking action, and open to being held accountable. Um, and if you can do those four things, or just be accepting of those four things, then you can become coachable. That's, see, that's this is where I things. think you were threatening to coach me. So uh -huh. on, let's do it. I'm open. Yeah. Yeah. So you're open. If you're open to all that, um, then, um, then yeah, you're coachable. Yeah. Uh, so the question would be, uh, what is, what is the thing in your life, uh, that you want to unlock? Oh, geez. I need a, I have to open up a new notebook here. There are well, so many things. Do you, do you need just one or just one, you know, um, change is hard. We don't, we don't diminish that at all. Um, and so we always, we always say like, you may have a whole list, uh, but just pick one. Let's start on the one. And once we've accomplished that, then we can move on to others. Okay. I am writing a book about podcasting. It's mm -hmm. been 
I am ashamed to say this. I'm actually embarrassed. It has been in a folder on my desktop for seven years. Wow. I'm not happy about that. But my co-host, Ben Gay III, who is the author of The Closers, which is a very famous group of books about sales, he got me on our two episodes ago. He said, Denise, I want a book from you. I said, well, I am writing one, which I'm really not. It's seven years old, not published. And he said, no, you don't understand. You're going to write a book and you're going to be part of the Closer series. You are now Closers Part 4. And I went, okay. You have no, once I got over going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm writing the book. But somebody had to get a hold of me, shake me by the collar and say, Denise, you can do this. You will do this. And I'm expecting it. Mm. It mm. helped. And now that I've put this thing off forever and ever and ever, I can't wait to get up and hit my my notepad or lucid dream. You know, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And then start writing. I'm writing every single day. You couldn't have told me a month ago I would be doing this. Oh, mm. that's fantastic. Yeah. And do you have a system of accountability in place? When, when, uh, when that motivation I do. should last. Yeah. yeah, I do. I'll send a note. If I haven't sent a note to Ben saying, okay, I'm writing this part, this part, I get a note back. So where is it? Oh, it's coming. It's coming. And it oh, wow. do. I do not want to let this man down. He's, I've got five favorite people in the world. He's in the top two. Wow. What a great accountability partner you have. Yeah, when he's he scary. Knew... <laughs> he scares me. He doesn't. He, yeah. He's when, one of the uh, best people in the world. You... When do you plan to have the book finished? Honestly, within two months. I've given myself two months to write it, edit it, get it over to him, rearrange it, do whatever has to happen. But I've gave myself two months. After seven years, you would think that's ridiculous, but it's not. It's now in my head. Uh, no, yeah, I, that's... I don't think it's ridiculous at all. I, I'm totally with you, Denise, that when you have the right partner, Uh, be that, you know, an accountability partner, a coach, a friend, a a co-author, whatever it may be, that is just magic. That's where it starts to come together. Um, When I'm left to just my, my own self-talk and my own self-doubts, man, uh, very few things actually get accomplished. So um, it's no surprise at all. And I'm so, so delighted to hear that you have such a wonderful friend and mentor. Thank you. How did you guys write your book? Well, <laughs> we had a lot of conversations. I bet. Uh, and that is, I mean, it's, I love ours, ours happened really fast. Yeah. I have to, I have to confess. So um, in June of 22, mm-hmm. we started thinking about the book, came up with the title. Um, I think by October 22, we had the by, title. Yeah. By October, we had the title. By November, we had decided to write it. In January, January 1st, 2023, Mm -hmm. um, we decided we were going to write a book. Um, We were fortunate enough to be part of this 100 Coaches community. So we reached out immediately to a couple dozen members of the community to get their input Mm -hmm. uh, on the book itself. Um, Got a first draft written. uh, Realized that that was not the book that we wanted. Mm. And so yeah, that's what happened to me. The one that's in my, my folders is like, who wrote yeah. this? I don't even recognize it. I know. Well, and part of it for us was, so we had written, it's actually the first two parts of the book. We, we rewrote it a lot, uh, since, since that first draft, but the biggest, uh, the biggest epiphany that we had was there was something missing from the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it took us a little while and by a little while, I mean like a week, uh, but we figured it out. Uh, we called it to what end? And that actually became, I think, the name of the third part of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and the whole point was, you know, we we tell you in the first part of the book everything you need to know about coaching so you can find a coach and what that relationship should look like. Then in the second part of the book, uh, we tell you how to become coachable, which was the whole intention of the book. And we thought we'd be done there. But then we thought, no, like to what end? Like why even bother? What is the point of being coached? What's the point of becoming coachable? Um, and, um, where do you, you go from have, there? You probably had an lucid dream. I just, uh, I don't dream. I, I, I would say I have waking dreams. All of my waking moments are dreamlike. So, um, the idea that we came up with was this idea of flourishing. 
uh, that that the aspiration for coaching is to move people up the what we'll call sort of the leadership pyramid, uh, which I'll describe. We'll describe in a moment to become flourishing leaders, uh, because what we found is leadership is sort of on this two by two grid. Uh, leaders think of uh, you know, and the lowest you know this the way these things work in the lowest left hand corner of that two by two is the uh, you're you're going sort of from thinking about yourself to thinking about others. And on the vertical axis, you go from thinking about how you're going to get things to thinking about how you're going to create things from extraction to expansion. So in the lower right-hand corner, you have people we call strivers. Um, those are people who are trying to figure out what they can get for themselves as a leader. Uh, they're trying to create more money for themselves, more power for themselves, whatever it is, those are striving leaders. That's in our view of the world, sort of the lowest level of leadership. Yeah. Very zero sum. Yeah. Uh, and then we move across. So it's still on the lower level, it's still ultimately extractive, but it has a, a, a we focus rather than a me focus. And that's what we call people pleasing. But this essentially is giving away your power to the opinions and perceptions of other people. So uh, this is someone who who tends to pull stuff out of the system still, but for, for the benefit of other people and they still haven't fit. I mean, it's, it's, it looks good in some ways, uh, but again, it really rids people of ownership and agency and ultimately doesn't create more for everyone um, tends to, to drain people. Right. It's zero sum. I mean, yeah. it's diminishing. It's uh, it looks good on paper, uh, but in reality, it's not creating more mm -hmm. for everyone. Um, so, um, a, a better leader and, and a, probably a pretty good leader, um, is a rising leader. Um, and that's a leader that understands that the job of leadership is to create growth and expansion. Uh, they want to grow the company. They want to do good, you know, have, help have their employees also, uh, grow in their roles. Uh, but they're also still very much thinking about themselves and their own career, how much they can get. Um, Their primary focus is still very much on themselves. These yeah. are people who are tend to be focused on, again, power, authority, position, title, uh, income, and all of those. I mean, none, none of those things are bad per se in and of themselves, but ultimately it's still somewhat selfish. Um, Absolutely. And, 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 and it holds them back. It holds them back. It holds the system back. Mm -hmm. um, and what we notice is you can't really have true expansion uh, when the primary motivation is selfish. Yeah. When the, when the primary motivation is more for me, mm -hmm. but what we really talk about in the flourishing perspective is more for everyone and more for everyone creates more for me as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's, but it's a byproduct. It's not the primary goal or driver more for everyone is about creating things like legacy um, for creating positive impact in the world, for being focused on all of the key stakeholders and all of the people that we're in relationship with. So that might include our employees, our customers, the environment, our families, and ourselves too. And we have to have all of those relationships in healthy balance. Uh, but it's amazing when we tap into that, uh, the entire system can flourish together. And, and also, I think that correlates so nicely with the process of writing our book is that how many hands touched it, mm -hmm. how many people have been involved in our own professional journeys. Um, and when we recognize that, um, we really all rise together. It's yeah. A beautiful thing. Denise, one of the fun parts of the book, and, and you'll see it, in the, you see it in the book, um, the final chapter in the book is actually a... So we, we came up with the, I, the, the concept of flourishing. We fleshed it out on long walks with Marshall, uh, sometimes, oh. sometimes in malls, if it was raining. Uh, <laughs> so we had these long walks and then, um, and we would record them. And, um, and so the final chapter of the book is, um, a slightly edited recreation of the conversation that we had. Uh, which really is delightful because I think it it shows the interaction that we had mm -hmm. uh, and what it feels like to be flourishing, which is just so elevating. Mm -hmm. uh, in the audio in the audio book, uh, you can hear the conversation because we uh, we each read our parts in the audio book. It's also also a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I but, I don't have the audio book yet. I will get it. I just wrote yeah. that 
get the audio book. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of my, I think my personal favorite part of the book is um, the acknowledgement section. I love reading acknowledgement sections in any book or work because it, you get to see how it all comes together. Uh, but our acknowledgement section also has uh, each of our three voices kind of pulled out and distinct. But there's just so many. You'll, you'll, if you read that, you'll see how many hands have touched this, mm -hmm. how many people uh, are in each of our lives. And it's just a, I don't know, it's just a really beautiful celebration of so many relationships and wonderful, wonderful people. I love how much you love your book. <laughs> I do. Well, you you will see when you uh when you put it to bed uh it's really it's it's a thing of wonder it really mm -hmm. is it's uh uh in hindsight hopefully this inspires you uh to move forward more swiftly um <laughs> faster but, more but in, in in hindsight uh the book uh you know you think of a book as being this sort of output that you know you're gonna have this thing um, but I think at the end of the day, a, a book is an internal exploration of a topic, uh, and that you're, you're working on it. You're trying to figure out like, what is this topic? How do I understand it? Um, and then finally you, you understand it, you get it right. You can put it into a book, um, and other people go on the journey with you, uh, to understand the thing that you just figured out. Can you put that on a plaque and send it to me? Sure can. Of course. I love that. And it makes sense because I think that was the struggle that I had with this book back in the day. I was trying to be educational. Podcasting is not educational. It comes from the heart. And I wasn't showing that. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I love the process too. It, the whole process of writing a book and uh, in editing it, it is, I mean, it's very much putting your heart on your sleeve and showing um, showing what's inside and your own exploration and growth, but it's also the process of being coachable. Mm -hmm. you know, you're taking edits and feedback and you're interacting with other people and their perceptions and ideas. Um, yeah, it's, right. just, it's just an amazing growing process. I, I, and I suspect, Denise, with you and your book, the same thing is happening. It just took you a little bit longer where, you know, you're kind of circling. Bit. Yeah. yeah. You're, That's you're, very kind. you're circling the you know you're circling the airport and you're waiting for uh air traffic control to tell you you're ready to land oh, and until you feel you're ready to land right. that you're going to circle and then all of a sudden all of a sudden you get the message that now is the time and once you get the message you have a flight plan and you know your flight path and it's all going to come together for you and see, that is beautifully succinct, and you just described it. I mean, it's been bugging me, and you talk about those two arrows. You know, I've got to write this book. I've got to write this book. It would keep me awake at night, and I don't sleep well anyway. So when you add that procrastination, irritation mm. to it, not helpful. Yeah. Now, air traffic control is telling me go. <laughs> so I love it. Right. <laughs> well, and also, I don't know if uh, five years ago or seven years ago, uh, you would have been part of uh, Dr. Ben's network. Yeah, yes, uh, and I would believe been... that Ben is a, a sales master. But no, mm -hmm. well, I've known Ben for quite a long while. And he, you know, about a year ago decided he wanted to be my, my co-host. I said, sure, because he is a wealth of information. And you know, he's worked with people like Zig Ziglar, Dr. Napoleon Hill, Earl Nightingale, he can tell stories. And I told him, I said, honestly, the reason I want you to come on my podcast or co-host with me is because you need to write your autobiography <laughs> and we're doing mm -hmm. it while we're talking. So we're kind of both, you know, at each other, write the book, write the book, write the book. But I love how you guys talk about leadership and listen, leadership is getting a bit of a bad rap. You know, there's just, this is my opinion only. There are a lot of leadership coaches out there who, and I can look at them and think, uh, you're not in the right, you're in the wrong lane. I'm sure you see that as Ooh. well, which is why you surround yourselves yeah. by the best. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I agree. Um, leadership does have a, does get a bad name. And at the same time, it's all we've got. It is all we have. Listen, you want to watch leadership? 
watch a three-year-old get his own way. Yeah. <laughs> they don't lose. <laughs> yeah, no, so done. true. But it's, you know, look, um, leadership is where all change is going to happen, right? I mean, almost by definition, because leadership doesn't have to be the CEO of the company. You know, there are great stories of leadership that rise, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid, that somebody steps forward and says, things have to change. That's leadership. Right. And they and they get people, they galvanize people, and they get the support, and all of a sudden, change happens. And uh, we're big fans of recognizing that leadership can happen uh, anywhere in the organization. In fact, you know, the role of the people who are in the top level of an organization is to foster that leadership throughout the organization. That's how they, that's how they achieve real success. Exactly. And Jacqueline, I know we're running out of time. I wanted to ask you this because I mentioned it at the very top of the show. You you have a strong focus on conscious capitalism. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So again, uh, it's like what we've talked about a little bit earlier here, where it's this focus, not just on uh, the shareholders, so not just on financial returns, uh, but instead being focused on all of the key stakeholders that are in our lives. Uh, and those stakeholders for our businesses can include, again, our, our employees, our customers, our suppliers, uh, our, certainly ourselves and our families, our communities, uh, and also the planet. And when we have all of those things that we're aware of, uh, we're not just looking at a single metric of success, uh, i.e. the financial return, but we start thinking about all of those things in concert with one another, then we tend to lead businesses in a way that's far more conscious. Um, yeah, it's well, great. I We are running out of time, and I hate that. I think I told you in, in the... Um, pre-interview that this is about the fastest 60 minutes on the internet. It just goes so quickly. Scott, what are some of the current trends or developments in your field and how are they impacting your work or your industry? Um, you know, I think the biggest, I think of, uh, of some of the greatest leaders that we've met, uh, folks like Alan Mulally and Uber Jolie and, um, the biggest the biggest trend is leaders recognizing that they don't have to know everything and that they don't know everything. Oh, um, nice. I know it sounds crazy, right? No, but it's it's <laughs> so true. It took me the longest kind of time when I started my my digital agency web development to teach myself to say I don't know, but I'll find out. Uh, absolutely, I'll tell you. Here's a here's an even bigger unlock that happened for me. Um, even when I feel I do know, I know that I should more often than not say nothing and allow other people to share their insights, which may well be better than mine. Uh, and even if they're not better than mine, uh, fostering and encouraging an environment, I hope now I'm like Jacqueline, I hope she agrees that I'm doing this, um, fostering and encouraging an environment where people feel comfortable speaking up, creates diversity in thinking, bigger solutions, uh, it means that you don't have to do everything. Um, when I think about leadership at the highest levels, which is you know most of most of the coaching that that we that that our coaches do are SVP and above, senior vice president and above, and major organizations and government leaders. Um, those folks can't do everything. Like the job is too big. They have to rely on the people around them, and more than rely on people around them, they have to foster and encourage the greatness of those people, and that's how they accomplish what they need to accomplish. Understood. So Jacqueline, same question, kind of phrased a little bit different, differently. What are some of the biggest opportunities and challenges facing your work and how do you see them evolving into the future? Oh, it's a big question. Uh, no, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think the big thing we are talking a lot about um is how do we let people know about us and what we do? Uh, and just letting people know we exist. I think that uh, I personally feel a little more comfortable being behind the scenes and I, I don't like being in front of things. And Marshall has this great question he asks us. He says, would the world be better off or worse off if more people knew who you were and what you did? Are you making, are you making yeah. a positive difference in the world and in the lives of other people? And of course, the answer is yes, the world would be better. We believe the world would be better off. 
Uh, and so he says, so get over yourself, <laughs> you know, okay. stop, stop being your own limiting belief. There's and, your plaque. Uh, get over yeah. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's some great coaching right there. Yeah. So uh, that's what it, I'm working it makes on. Sense. Well, I am so happy for both of you. And listen, I never do this on, on the radio, but I'm going to do it to now, to now. I can't talk. You know what, Scott, I'm blaming you because I'm drinking a cup of cold coffee i don't like coffee but it's sitting here and it has very little cat fur in it so i'm gonna try to drink it and it's (laughs) just for i I don't drink coffee with cat fur (laughs) apparently i do that is where i draw the line i just looked at it and went i don't even like coffee but yesterday i think this is from yesterday i felt like i needed it so you know i'm not an aficionado but but What I want to do is just tell you guys that I have access to a lot of high value podcast hosts. With your permission, I'm going to introduce you to all of them. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You are. This has been such a lovely time together. You're so, so sweet and generous. Really appreciate it. And see, now you just ruined my reputation. (laughs) <laughs> oh, you can you can cut that out. Oh, that was that was just for you. you don't have oh. to broadcast that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being with me, Scott and Jacqueline. I sincerely appreciate your company today, and spending time with you has been a distinct pleasure. And I love your book. I will get a review out for Amazon and Goodreads, and I'm going to do my best to share this so people can find you. So before I let you go, could, would you mind sharing your online presence? and your preferred means of contact for those who wish to learn more about you? Of course. So sweet. Uh, Well, you can certainly find both of us on LinkedIn. Uh, Scott has an amazing newsletter that he publishes every week on Tuesdays. I highly recommend (laughs) subscribing to that. Uh, So you can find us there. You can also find more about the 100 Coaches Agency at 100coachesagency.com or more about our book at becomingcoachable.com. And it's on Amazon too, and Audible apparently. So I'm yep. heading there next. And Audible, yeah. <laughs> I, I am definitely going to be listening to that. I don't know about y'all. I prefer to read. I don't like videos. I'm not much of a visual person because I'm always in my head. I'm always thinking. Mm. Yeah, and I'm building word pictures. But if I can hear you or read you, I'm all in. So I'm doing both with you guys. So listen, everybody, as we conclude today's episode, your feedback means an awful lot to me. So if you found this show helpful, please support us with a quick review on iTunes. And why? Because your input is vital in my mission to inspire and empower more individuals. So don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a review, and share your partner in Success Radio with friends and colleagues. And listen carefully. Be sure to go find Scott Osman and Jacqueline Lane on the web and connect with them. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Denise. It's really been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Mine as well. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab.